All right, so today we're going to talk about physical design, um, the process, data types, how you resolve certain kinds of relationships. And I'll talk about uh, the two kinds of keys that you tend to deal with. All right, so when we're resolving relationships, uh, there's three kinds of relationships in a database, as you as be expected. Uh, one to one, there's no resolving that needs to be done. I mean, there's literally nothing that needs to be done when it's a one to one relationship. Uh, one to many, it's optional to resolve one to one uh, in rare cases because there are cases sometimes where um, one to many may not do the job just right or the other way around. Um, many to many, you, it says here's it's almost always desirable. Let me get rid of a word in there. You, you should never even refer to the word almost. You always resolve many to many um, because many to many is a very bad thing in a database. So that would mean that you have two tables and they're both parents of each other. And if you end up having a lot of interrelated records, uh, you'll end up with a situation like uh, when I first started working for Compaq, well, sorry, it was digital back then. This was years ago, 24 years ago. I inherited a database and they asked me to clean it up a little bit. So I noticed this one table looked a little weird and there was another table looked a little weird. I'm like, okay, well, at a first glance, it looks pretty safe. So I started deleting records out of the one table. And a delete statement that should have run in, you know, 500 milliseconds was still running five minutes later. And I'm like, I just stopped. I went. And I sighed. And then I stopped the database server. And I started the database server and discovered that half the data was gone. Not the one row I tried to delete because. This row was related to that row, which was related to this row, which was related to that row. That was a many to many. It's a very bad thing. You don't want to almost always desirable. It's always desirable because you have to do it. So when you resolve a many to many, which essentially is the important one we have to think about, um, essentially we're dealing with two lists that have duplicate data. And if we want to ask where's were made, how many sell, it's hard to tell unless we do something with it. So what we end up doing with a many-to-many -many relationship is we add what's called an associative entity. Um, there are, is actually two things for this. There's a, a associative and intersection. Um, essentially, uh, they're just different degrees of the same thing. So in this case, you resolve it by creating a new table in the middle. And so a many-to-many -many relationship like this becomes like this. And this little table sitting here in the middle is known as an associative entity. <laughs> Depending what textbooks you read, uh, they may call this an intersection entity. What is the difference between an associative entity and an intersection entity? An intersection entity only has foreign keys in it. That's it, nothing else. The second you add any kind of other data in there, a date, prices, anything, it's no longer an intersection, it's an associative entity. It's an entity that associates two other tables. Basically, the point is it creates a bridge between two other tables so that a given student can take as many subjects as they want. Any given subject can be taken by as many students as they want. But if we were to, you know, dismiss a student, we wouldn't lose the subjects. If we stop, we decide to drop a subject, we don't lose the students. We would lose the association in this table. Um, most commonly, it is a compound key. So it is a foreign key that is part of a primary key. And it's a compound key. So primary key, foreign key, primary key, foreign key, one big fat foreign key. They're both foreign keys. Therefore, it's also a compound key. Also known as it's an everything key. It's literally each of these, this table has a key that's one of everything in one, in one go. Um, 
intersection tables are not as common as they used to be, uh, specifically because of uh, data auditing requirements that most modern enterprises have. We need now nowadays, whenever you create a database, pretty much for any table, we need to know who created the data, who last modified the data, who deleted the data, when was it created, modified, or deleted. We need to know all these things. And depending on the level of are you asking a question or are you stretching? Okay. So just give me a finish so I can finish my thought. And depending on the level of auditing you require, you will need to add you know, four, six fields to the every associative entity, therefore, uh, every intersection entity, therefore, they're all associative because they all have those pieces of information in it. Uh, there are also cases where a student may take a subject more than once. You know, student comes in, student bombs level one, they got to take level one again. It's still in the system that they took this class, but they need to be marked off as having taken it a second time. Therefore, we need extra pieces of information in there to keep track of that. Because it's a primary key made up of two foreign keys. So because there are two pieces in the primary, well, two or more pieces in the primary key, it's a compound key. Well, it's the intersection because it's literally a child. It, it's a child table that of two different tables. That's essentially it. So if you've got a table that is a child of two other tables, it's an inter, it's an intersection table. Uh, common common one of that would be you have an order, you have products, you have order lines. Even though the order line will have quantity, selling price, taxes, all that, because it's a child of both the product and the order. It's an associative entity. Well, if it, it, it's two foreign keys, then it's an intersection table. More than two, it's associative. So essentially, in the industry, third intersection and associative have become basically synonymous because intersection tables are so rarely created. Now, they still exist in old systems, but they're so rare now because you need to have date stamps. You need to have ownership stamps you know, that kind of user IDs and that kind of stuff. Therefore, there's always going to be more than just the foreign keys. So they're basically all associative tables. All right, so that takes care of the many to many. Do you have a question? Yep. Well, no, well, no, that's just the end result of this. So that's what's happening is the database tables we were given have a specific naming convention that was followed, but they're still doing this. So, yes, and I'm not disagreeing with you. It's uh, during the design process, the synthetic keys, that's what you're talking about. Those are synthetic keys. I'm actually be talking about those later today. Those happen later. During the design process, you work with what you're given. Then once you're starting to do the physical design, you'll look at it and go, this is an ideal. It needs synthetic keys. Now, when I do my own design for like in the real world, everything has synthetic keys. The problem is that to learn the database design theory, you have to realize that synthetic keys isn't the only choice you have. Therefore, we teach you how it used to be done as opposed to, because what's going to happen is you leave up somewhere, they may not use synthetic keys. They may choose to use natural keys. 
Therefore, you need to understand the shitty way of doing things before you can use the appropriate way. Like if you end up using a development framework, because I think it was your group I talked about uh, the de facto naming conventions. As another side effect of that is everything has got synthetic keys in most frameworks. Why? Because synthetic keys never change. I'll be talking about that later. So yeah, I know where you're coming from. And most of the databases I give my students when I'm teaching them SQL are set up like that. No, there is no perfect natural key. There is none. There's no such thing. Therefore, in the end, you end up synthetic keys for everything. I mean, a SIN number is invalid because it can change. An email address can change. Phone numbers change. You know, if you do a combination of things, one of those things may change. Names aren't static. You know, some kind, some subcultures, you get married, the woman takes the man's name. You go to Japan, the man might take the woman's name or the woman might take the man's name. Over there, it's kind of fluid. You don't, there's no rule on who gets what name. It just depends which family you're marrying into, more or less. Therefore, names are not a safe way to bet. And then you've got other countries where people don't even have last names. So, you know, names are not a good way to do a key. Phone numbers are no good. Your numbers are a really dangerous one to use. Not just because they can change, it's because it's data sensitive information. Passport IDs, same thing, you know, that kind of stuff. It's all, so natural keys are not great. Synthetic keys are better, but those come in at the end when you are targeting specific frameworks or you're targeting specific rules at whatever you work for. That's it. So what the exercise they're making you do is they're making you work with what exists before you get to, you don't need to create your own. You need to understand how to work with what you're given first, which is very painful. But it is what it is. Okay. So uh, the design process, it's an iterative process. It's just like software development. Uh, anybody who's written a program knows you don't write a pro the whole program in one go. Uh, you tend to write a little bit, make sure it works. You add a little bit more, you make sure it works. Uh, you add types to your Pokemon, you know. Making fun of them. <laughs> so there's no perfect design. What happens when you try to reach for perfection, often you just cause more problems. You just keep designing and adding and adding and adding it to the point where it gets overly complicated. As someone who kind of did a bit of that when they first started, like when I first started working in the industry, I tended to over-design everything I did. Like all my database designs were insane until, you know, my employers like, you don't need to go that far, like too much information, too much detail. We don't need this. And, you know, I had to learn to cut it back a little bit. Uh, so you have to achieve what's called good enough. If it checks off the needs of the business, it's good enough. If it checks off potential things that are going to come down the pipe for the company later, that's more than good enough. If you're planning to track the weather for a company that sells groceries, that's overkill. So there's four process, There's four steps in the process. Step one, you identify. So you identify what needs to be diagrammed. So that's pretty straightforward. Whether you work with a clean room environment or you're using documents, you're going to identify all the entities. Then you're going to describe them. In other words, assign attributes, define the relationships. You're going to do some normalization, and then you're going to review. So identification. Depending on the source of the data, two common paths tend to emerge. The first one is recreation or reverse engineering. Uh, we all know that reverse engineering is a bad phrase because uh, that usually means you have access to the source and you're just remaking it uh, as opposed to a you know, clean room implementation. Um, so that basically you have an existing system, you need to recreate. Good. Uh, path two is a clean room implementation, um, which tends to be significantly more fun and a lot more creative. Uh, you, you basically are given saying, oh, I need you to create a database to track insert topic here. And you go and you have nothing given to you for previous data, sample data, none of that. So you end up having to do, sit down, you have conversations with the stakeholders, feel for what they want to do. You do a design. You talk to them. 
you go back and forth for a little bit until you've pretty much established what you wanted, but you're working in a clean room implementation in the sense that it's a completely new project. Um, however, the common steps is you identify all the possible gross data objects. Uh, they're the big entities, so customers, or just, uh, you know, users for the system, uh, products, that kind of thing. Um, and then you tend to list all the objects and you categorize them, you know, how important they are and what kind of things they belong to. Uh, then you describe them. So you're going to, with all the objects, you're going to put in all the basic fields or the attributes, depending on what it is you're doing. Uh, if you happen to know what the primary keys or the candidate keys are, you'll put them in. Um, you try to identify as much upfront as possible um, while well, you can before you, you don't want to spend too much time iterating back and forth with the client because you added a bunch of fields, you meeting, three days from now you have your meeting. They say, yeah, we're missing this, 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 and this. So you go back, you add those changes, then that triggers your brain to say, oh yeah, well, maybe this all means also what we need in this. Put those in, book another meeting three days later. So it takes time to do this iteration. So if you tend to, and this is something that comes with experience. So the longer you've been doing it, the more obvious, I guess is the right phrase, certain sets of data can go together. Um, like for example, I'd say I want to create a customer record. For me, I'd automatically there'll be a uh, an optional company name, a customer name, and uh, two fields for a street address, a city, a uh, state or province, postal code, country, phone number, fax number, email address, um, opt-in, opt-out of email, uh, created date, last modified date, username, possibly password, possibly. You know, that's just off the top of my head. That's me thinking about a customer. That's experience, right? I've done it enough that this is just stuff that happens automatically. When you're first starting out, it's not as easy. So you tend to want to, A, reach out to your peers and say, hey, this is what I found. Can you think of anything else I've missed? Is there anything in here? Obviously, it's stupid that shouldn't be in here. And then you do that. Uh, then you try to assign some data types. At the first pass, you just want to put in rough data types. So you're going to say, oh, name, that's a varcar field. You don't even set a length. You just say it's a varcar. Um, phone number, that's a varcar. Uh, Opt-in, opt-out, that's probably a Boolean. Because, you know, opt-in of email, yes or no. And you're just going to set some basic data types. You can worry about refining the lengths later. But in the first pass, you want to give it as much detail as you can. Uh, then you want to create your relationships. So you figure out what's connected to what. You know, an order has many order lines. A product can be in many order lines. A uh, customer can place many orders. You know, you set up those kinds of relationships. Uh, so you decide which ones are parents, which ones are children. Um, you identify which relationships are mandatory. Uh, you create the foreign keys as needed. Um, if you are hand coding, you're literally going to have to type in all the commands for the foreign keys. Uh, I don't know if as part of your SQL class last term, you learned about the create table commands very much or not, um, about how to create foreign keys and constraints and stuff like that. If you're hand coding, you've got to be very careful. If you're using the diagramming tool, it usually creates them for you automatically. It even sets the data types properly so that it carries across the way it should, because um, that's a common mistake people make when they're first starting out is, oh yeah, I got a foreign key and they picked the wrong. So you have a primary key that's a an int or a big int, and then you create your foreign key as an int or a small int, like not, it's an int, but not the same kind of int. And suddenly your foreign key runs out of room because the primary keys are now too big. So, you know, it's a good thing for tools. Um, normalization. Well, we talked about normalization. So you just want to make sure that your tables are normalized. Um, essentially, that every, you want to get to the third normal form. Uh, you want to create reference tables as needed. Uh, that is to get rid of repeated values. Where, um, like a common one you'll see is country, uh, state or province, or you know political division, whatever you call it, wherever you're from. Um, the some people get a little crazy and they'll even do the city the city you shouldn't because it gets a little gross because you have to have every single little city in the drop down and it 
depending on what you define as a city, that list can get really, really big. I mean, Ontario, for example, is a really interesting place. Um, most people, actually, you know, a lot of you are international students, uh, probably don't know that the definition of a city changes in Ontario depending how north you go. So you get to North Bay, a city is um, a population of 39,000 and up. You go past North Bay, a city is a population of 9,500 and up. Because the towns are so small that they're still cities. So they're treated as a city because it's the biggest population center for 50 kilometers in either direction. And then, you know, so down here, what we call a town up there would be a city. So that means that even things that are even smaller than that, like my hometown has a population of 9,000 and change. There's a little town just outside of town called Kittigan. Kittigan's got a population of like 25 people, but they actually are on a map with a sign on the highway. So they would actually have to be included in a city drop down. So it's better off to not, you know, create reference tables for that. Uh, other reference tables you'll see in systems that are common would be uh, shipping methods. So if you've got a company that ships physical product and you have multiple methods of shipping, you don't want to have to constantly put in Purolate or FedEx, whatever. You just want to pick it from a list. So things that get repeated, strings that get repeated regularly in the database, you tend to want to break out into a reference table. Uh, that helps with normalization because you only need to update descriptions in one place. Um, do you replace fields in the standard tables with the reference table of foreign keys? Obviously, if you're going to take the state province column and you turn it into a foreign table, that means it needs to be a foreign key. So you want to normalize third normal form with as little redundant data as possible. Um, and then you do a review. So you look for potential issues. You go, okay, did I cover all the bases? You try to find someone to review your design. Key you have up here, or a coworker that you can ask and say, hey, do you mind putting eyes on this? And, you know, am I out to lunch? Am I on task? Am I not doing this right? Um, after you identify weaknesses, you go back to step one, you know, you identify, you refine, you improve, uh, and then, you know, review one more time. Uh, you try to review with an eye of the future without over-engineering. A bit like my story earlier, as you know, when I first started out, I tend to over-engineer because I was thinking way down the road. I'm like, and the people are like, we're never going to worry about that ever. Uh, but you tend to not want to design yourself into a corner, like using the wrong size of data types. Uh, like using tiny ints for your primary keys is a bad idea because you'll run out of integers, um, that kind of thing. Um, one other good step, it's not listed on here with uh, the review process is try to finish your design on Friday. Sounds like very specific here. Finish your design on Friday, save your file and don't look at it till Monday. Because then you'll have two days of your brain resetting. And then you'll look at it on Monday and you're going to go, and then you'll go, okay, why did I choose to do this? And if you can't logically explain to yourself why you choose to do something, there's probably something wrong with your design. So that's actually one of my recommendations is often, I try to do that uh, as much as I can when I'm doing my day job is I try to not do database design changes not design, not changes to the actual database, but database design changes until the end of the week so that when I get back to it earlier the next week, I have a chance to let my brain percolate and reset so that I can see if my changes made sense. And that's actually good for a lot of different kinds of work, not just database design. It applies to programming. Uh, you get stuck. My biggest solution for getting stuck for programming is I usually stop working on it for a while. Whether I just stop and go take a walk, you know, pull out the favorite gacha game, you know, go watch some anime, watch some TV, go have a beer or 12, you know, just go do something else to allow your brain to just stop thinking about it for a bit. It'll fix your problems. Same thing with database design. It sounds like stupid advice, but it really does work. Take it as someone who's done this for long enough. No, stop thinking about a problem is often the best way to find a solution to your problem. All right, so test test data. Um, a lot of these sample databases you guys used probably last term have test data in them. And 
might come as a shock, but testing is important. You don't want to release something without it being tested. And the problem is, is that let's say you're the database designer, database architect, you have very little to do with development. The developers need data to test with. You're not going to expect the program to sit there and punch in 10,000 rows of data to test. The QA department needs data to test. You don't expect them to generate 10,000 rows of data. It's part of the design process. And if you're really wanting to test, you can generate insane amounts of data to load tests. And how long does these queries run when there's, you know, 100,000 rows in the database? Let's triple that to 300,000 rows. Is there a perceptible difference in the performance of the database? What can we do to improve the performance? Um, there's many sites that offer this service. Um, I think the last one on the bottom, Free Data Generator, disappeared recently. Um, GenerateData.com is my favorite. Um, you can actually download the source code and install it in your local Apache install. So it's PHP and MySQL. It's not an easy install. Just that it's not a double click, next, next, next thing. You're configuring PHP files, your web server. It's a pain. It's literally just, here's the structured source code, go to town, good luck. Uh, but I use Generate Data. I've actually, um, I used an older version of it because uh, the newer version was flaky for a bit. Uh, I modified it so I could generate insanely large data sets because uh, it had a built-in limit of a thousand rows at a time. I modified it to allow a million rows at a time uh, because I needed the load test. So I added, you know, a couple of extra zeros to the limiter and it just worked. Um, la computer would run out of memory, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, you did. Well, you'll always have a QA environment, so you'll have your dev environment, which might be on your local machine. You'll have a QA environment where QA tests, and then you'll have a production environment. You don't want to develop against the production environment. Um, uh, the company I work at has a phrase for that. We call that ra ramble coding, uh, because we're like creeping in and modifying stuff while it's happening, and it's really not that not a good thing, because uh, if you make a mistake, it affects production. Uh, we try to avoid that as much as humanly possible. Um, but yeah, you normally have three environments. You've got your dev environment, your QA environment, uh, and then your production environment. Sometimes you have four. So you have your dev environment, which is your local machine or whatever. you got the QA environment, which the QA people validate. You have a staging environment, which is you take a snapshot of the production environment, put it on staging, apply your changes, Make sure that that doesn't break, and then you apply it to production. It, it there's quite the pipeline between, you know, your development environment and production. I have no idea. Not in this course. Not in this course. That's uh, that's way down the pipe. Okay, so I'm actually going to show you guys GenerateData.com. That's actually on my list of things I want to show you. Okay, so generate data is actually kind of cool. Actually, it, it even remembers the last time I set this up when I was demoing this to students last term. Uh, it uses cookies and it remembers. So you can see that you can add rows, uh, like columns, and you can give it the names. Um, you can set some samples on how the data gets generated. So you can actually choose the pieces it's going to generate. And you have all kinds of data um, you can do. I'm going to just get rid of this one. And what's really cool about this one is, for example, you see this, um, the country one. I can set it up to pick which countries I want to generate data for. So then when I set up the region, which is a postal code, I can say, only grab regions that belong to those countries when it generates. So if I just add Canada as a country, it'll only put in Canadian provinces. If I add the US, it'll do Canadian provinces and American states. Add the UK, it'll do the UK, whatever the frig it is in the UK. Um, and this is saying it's going to do them full or short. So that'd be, you know, like Ontario versus ON. Um, postal code, it's based on the region. This thing's able to figure out how to generate postal codes that actually match where your data is going. Um, and email, you can actually get it to base it on the person's name so you can get email addresses that look real. 
Uh, CVV is as if I wanted a credit card. Um, so I can actually add in, uh, these are all the different kinds of data you can do. And we could go uh, credit card and we want to do any, uh, let's do Visa MasterCard. So I am going to generate some data and generate. And it downloaded. So I think I've got a font issue here. There we go. Um, somewhere over here. Yeah, it's not acting right. Of course it's not. There is an option to somewhere over here. You can actually set what kind of data it's going to output. I just don't know why it's not doing it. Um, I'm going to generate it again. Let's see if when it gives me the download button. Uh, this generated as HTML. There's the data generated. It actually has options. I'm probably going to have to clear my cache and reload so you can actually see how you can adjust the settings. Uh, but you can see right here, like, here's American Postal Codes, Canadian Postal Codes. Uh, you can see that here, Ivana, uh, Ivana Price, it actually generated what, fake email addresses. Oh, here's a free, fake credit card with a fake CVV. So you can generate data that looks real to test. And this, so that means if you're going to write queries, you can make it look right. Uh, it'll, you can actually get the names to be region locked so that uh, if you are doing, you know, European names, the names will tend to be more European than North American kind of thing. It's got a fair amount of fairly cool features like that. And now I am going to clear my page, say yes. I just don't know why this is not working right. Close this, go to generator. Turn off the preview. Uh, don't know why it's not going all the way down. It's too bad. Of course, it's not working right. Um, turn on the preview. Uh, I'm going to go names really quick like that and go good. Turn off the preview, turn on the preview. And it looks like the guy's site's borked a little bit. Of course it is. Um, yeah, so I don't know why it's not working. Let me go uh, in private window. Oh, there's there it is. Okay, so if I go name like that, now I can set the format. I don't know, just don't know why it wasn't coming up before. So I can set it to be SQL, MySQL. It'll generate the table. If you want, if you don't want to include the table structure, you can, you know, do that. You can also target different database engines. There's Postgres, there's Oracle, because Oracle doesn't do multi inserts, single row inserts only. Microsoft SQL Server, different layouts. So it'll actually generate SQL that matches whatever it is you're targeting. So it's a really handy tool. Uh, there's all kinds of cute tricks on doing this stuff with it. And, um, uh, you can also do uh, XML for those that want to work with that, or do you want to do a um, a Python data array? Yay! So if you want to generate some data for your Python or C sharp or PHP, you know, take your language; it's all there. Um, and then good old CSV if you just need to comment to limit stuff. So yeah, so. Generate data is great when it's working. I just don't know why it wasn't working. I think it has something to do with the fact that I'm plugged into the projector. My screen size is kind of wonky, so it's messing with it. Okay. So, moving on. Data types. So, by now you guys should know what data types are. Level two students in a programming course should know what data types are. Um, but in the database, it's interesting because we have slightly different data types. Um, we have car slash character. So the thing is, is that depending on the database server, it might call it car, might call it character. Uh, Microsoft SQL server has a special one called ncar. Uh, um, so character is a fixed length field. So you go car parentheses a number. So if you go car parentheses five, 
it's a fixed length field. It will always occupy five bytes in the database, regardless. Um, so that means even if you put in the letter A, it will still occupy five bytes. Uh, car was the go-to way, way back in the day. Back in the day when computers used tape to tape, because the car fields were always a set length, so that meant that when the database software needed to access a different record, it always knew how much tape to move because it always need, knew it needed to move tape for equivalent to five or 10 bytes. So it always knew just how many millimeters of tape it needed to do that. Um, a bit later, uh, once hard drives started being a thing, Varcar became very popular. Uh, those are variable length strings. Um, so that means if you define something as a Varcar 50, it will hold up to 50 characters. But if you only have the letter A, it will occupy one byte plus a little bit. So there's like a, dem a demarcation uh, bit of binary data in there. And depending on the database server, it uses different things, which is why there's not it's not quite precise. Uh, I know at one point Oracle used the ASCII code for a bell. So there's an ASCII code, and if you type it into your keyboard, it makes your computer go ding. And they used to store bell as the end of field terminator for the longest time, which was kind of cool. Just pointless trivia, but it, it was kind of cool. Um, so character varying is good because it doesn't occupy as much disk space. Uh, for a long time, character was faster than Varkar because the database didn't need to figure out how much data it needed to read. Uh, but modern database systems are so fast and so well optimized that there's no performance difference between them. So as a rule of thumb, you can probably use Varkar for everything. Unless it's a field you know will always have a set number of characters. For example, a Canadian postal code will always have six or seven, depending how you want to format it, characters. So you go car six for a postal code because it will never be less than six and it'll never be more than six. That's when you use a car. Everything else is a var car. Uh, text. Text is used to hold large chunks of data. Of course, MySQL is special. Um, and it decides to do things its own way. So it has three kinds of text fields. It's got uh, tiny text, text, and big text, or large text. I don't remember which one it is. And essentially, tiny text allows 255 characters. Uh, regular text is like 32,000 characters, and large text is big. Every other database server is large text. They don't have the smaller sizes. Why? Because it takes up no extra room, no extra processing. It's just legacy from what MySQL used to be. So before then, MySQL had lots of different little data types, just like got tiny int, int and big int and tiny text, text and big text. You know, they just got different sizes and almost nobody uses these different sizes. Um, Microsoft SQL Server doesn't call it text. They call it memo. Why, I don't know, but it's called Memo. I think it's leftovers from Access. But Microsoft SQL Server is based on Wacom SQL, which has text, so I don't know. They just changed the name to Memo to make it unique. And Oracle has does not have text. They have something called C -A CLOB, C-L-O-B. Character large object. But it's a text field. Um, it's just the thing that's special about Oracle's CLOB field is that it is uh non byte length it is character so that um it stores the data differently so that if you shove in chinese characters in there it behaves differently than say mysql would with field even though you can store chinese characters in the text field too the club field is not uh binary it's not um code page encoded so that means that if you put chinese characters in a club field you could even put English letters in the same field and they won't care. MySQL cares. You can only put one kind of character type in that field at a time. So it's just like differences for the same thing. Numbers. Uh, integers. I hope you guys know what integers are. Uh, level two. If my level ones know what an integer is, your level twos definitely should know what integers are. They're whole numbers. And as usual, we have integer, int, small int, Tiny int, medium int, and big int. And uh, depending on uh, which database engine you're talking about, um, these limits are slightly different. 
Uh, the bigot is insanely large. Um, the if I go pull up, actually, this and I go. I oh, know that's yeah. This this one here. If I go somewhere in here, we were talking about data types. There we go. These are the integers in MySQL. The other course talks a little more precise about the data types. So as you can see, uh, the big int is a really big number. It's a stupid big number. Um, a tiny int is uh, 0 to 255. MySQL does not have Boolean. If you try to use Boolean in MySQL, by the way, it turns into a tiny int 1. So it's a one byte integer which is kind of special. So that means it's like, you know, it has uh, zero to nine versions of yes and no. My skills gross uh, <laughs> for that. I'll just call it the way it is. Um, now where'd my mouse go? Hello, mouse. Not you over here. Um, you got decimals, numerics. Uh, why the reason they're they're on the same line is that they are systems of each other. All database servers support them both, and they are internally both the same thing. Uh, decimals and numerics are normally used for um, often for financials. Uh, when you talk about money, more a lot of database servers have a money data type, uh, but money is a strange one because of the way it acts, because it always assumes two two decimals of precision. Uh, but if you do a dec uh, a numeric, let's go five comma two. So the numeric is defined length and precision. So this would allow me to store That's the five. That's the two. So at most you can put in there is 999.99. What's cool about the numeric is that it'll do the rounding for you automatically because we all know humans suck at rounding. Uh, always let the computer do the rounding for you. I've had cases where I had labs where students didn't get the computer to the rounding for them, they got the wrong answers. Because the lab said, you know, give me the answer to this, the actual number to this, and they rounded it by hand and they got it wrong. It's a really bad way to lose points when all they needed to do was type in round and get it to round. So with the reason I was talking about why decimals and numerics are more used for financials is in most accounting systems, um, they actually track their decimal places to three or four places. They'll do a 10-3 or a 10-4. Um, why? Uh, foreign exchange. So the company I worked for before we got bought out last year, uh, we were a Canadian company. Our bank accounts were in Canadian, but we did all our business in U.S. dollars. We even sold to Canadians in U.S. dollars. For all intents and purposes, we were an American company, but everything else was Canadian. <laughs> Headquarters here in Ottawa. And so whenever there's foreign exchange, you want more decimals of precision. So later on, when you're doing the final conversions at the end of the year, the more precision you have on your foreign exchange, the less money you gain or lose from your exchange. So most like most accounting systems will display two decimal places, but they store three or four. And the that's what those are for. Uh, which leads me to a lot of people go, well, what about floats? Why can't you just use a float? That's like saying, I want to use a sledgehammer to put in a screw. A float and a double, which you guys probably know what those are, have a lot of decimal places of precision. For money, do we need precision to 36 decimal places? No. We need three or four. So the point is, is that when you're doing, you're picking your data types, even with number types, you want to pick the one that matches the closest to what your data is going to be like. Float and doubles are usually used for scientific and or uh, precision math. So 
um, you're tracking lengths of time, you are tracking, um, you know, variations on stress tests, that kind of thing. Exactly. You'd use a numeric with an appropriate number of decimal places. So then you also don't want to forget that you don't want to go uh, 4, 3, thinking that you put in 9,999.999. What 4, 3 lets you put in $9 and 9999. No, it, the, the maximum is based on whatever the database server supports. And different database servers have different limits. For example, Postgres is able to handle larger decimals than MySQL. Oracle obviously does bigger numbers than MySQL. I mean, MySQL does numbers big enough that you'll probably never run out. Just the other ones can do more. Um, we have bit, which is basically, you know, zero to, zero to eight, zero to nine. Um, it's tiny. Uh, we have date and time. Uh, we have date and date time. Date self-explanatory. It has a date. Date time includes the date and the time. We have a timestamp. Um, depending on the database server, MySQL is weird. What it calls a timestamp is not a timestamp. What a timestamp in MySQL is, it's a date time that automatically sets the first time you create the record. So it's a t date and time with a default. MySQL things. Uh, but everything else that has a timestamp has date time plus time zones. So that means it'll store, let's say I were to store my, the current date and time. So today is May 31st. So it would store uh, 2023 uh, 05 31 18 49 33 E minus 5. Five, five, off, five hours off of actually minus four because it's summer, but four is a minus four because it's four hours off GMT. That's the time zone. So it stores the time with the differential of where it would be from GMT. So if you have a system where you got users in multiple time zones accessing the data, you can write your application to read the timestamp and actually put it into a timestamp that applies to them. So if our record was inserted at 5 p.m. our time, Somebody in Europe would want to load it, but they don't want to see that it was inserted at 5 p.m. They want to see it that it was inserted at what would be 5 p.m. for us. So for them, it would have been uh, 1 p.m. So that allows you to convert the times. So that's what timestamps do. Uh, you time, you've got year, so you can just store a time. You can store just a year. Uh, not particularly useful unless it's very general purpose. Um, some database servers have something called an interval which is really cool. Uh, it's a high precision data type that allows you to measure how long something took. It doesn't care when it started. It doesn't care when it ended. It only cares about how long it took. And people look at me and go, well, usually what the heck point of that? It's really good for scientific and or uh, testing purposes. For example, um, you work in a factory that does mean time between failure testing. So you don't care that, you know, a machine 8 started at 9.01 a.m., machine 2 started at 9.02 a.m., machine 3 started at 9.03 a.m., you care about how long it before whatever inside of it failed, right? So who cares when it starts, when it stops? You only care about how long it lasts. That's what intervals are for. So you can always track how long thing, things took. And, you know, if you do track when things started, great. You can always do the math. Obviously, if you store start time, end time, you can always figure out the intervals, but sometimes if you just store the interval, you can do the math on the interval without having to do all the other math around it first. It's just uh, precision. Um, so these are the generic data types that all database servers have. Some database servers have more data types. Um, Oracle, if you give them ex enough money, they'll give you geometric data types. Um, Postgres, on the other hand, gives you the geometric data types for free. Uh, is MySQL? I don't know. I'd have to go check. Has, you know, so they finally gave MySQL ge geometric data types. Geometric data types are really cool. For example, with Postgres, if I want to store a circle in the database, you give it 
values, x, y, r. So it knows where the circle starts, and then it knows the radius of the circle. And you can literally write a query that says, give me everything where the circle's the radius is less than this. And it can actually query the geometric functions. Why would those kinds of data types be important? Geodata. Uh, Postgres is the number one database used for uh, for geomapping. Um, why? Because it's free. Oracle charges like $100,000 for the geo, the geomapping functionality. Apparently, MySQL finally has geometric data, so maybe they're going to get GIS support eventually. Uh, considering how flaky MySQL is, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, some of you may have noticed, you know, on the third floor of T building, you got the two or three rooms that are military. So those are who runs a program in joint with the Canadian military for GIS, geographic information systems. And the military uses Postgres for all their geo mapping systems. So the, there's a course here that teaches them how to convert maps into database data. So then you can run queries against a database to generate maps. It's kind of cool. Um, other data types you'll see, Postgres has uh, network data types. It'll store IP addresses, MAC addresses. You can actually run queries on IP address uh, tets. So you can say, I just want to know everything that's in 192168. Without using a wildcard, you can actually you know, format it to search that specific data type. Um, Microsoft SQL Service got some nifty ones for business transactions. Uh, Oracle's got pretty much one of everything, but as with anything else, Oracle, the more you want, the more you pay. So there's a reason why Oracle sales have been flipped for the last 15 years. They still make money, but their money isn't going up. Their money's going sideways. Um, so yeah, so those are the data types. There's some cool ones in there. Yes, old blobs. Actually, there it is right there on the screen. Okay, so when you choose your data types, you got to take the following things into consideration. How big is the data? So you pick a data type appropriate plus a little bit extra. Uh, is it numeric? Should you have decimal places? Uh, is If it's a date, you should include the time. Did you notice, I didn't write that as a question. If it's a date, should you include the time? The answer is yes. You should always include the time. Here's why. There's very few data type, like data points where the time is not important. Date of birth is probably the only one where is one of the few that who cares what time. Well, fine. I'm sure your mother cares what time you were born. She probably holds it over your head every year. But outside of that, nobody cares what time you were born, just what day. But realistically, for almost everything else, whenever you store a date, just use a date time and store the time it happened to. The reason for that is you can always strip off the time at display. If somebody asks you for time of something and you don't have the data, you can't invent it. It's better to collect a little bit extra at every transaction. And realistically, a date time field occupies something like an extra two bytes or an extra byte as opposed to a date field. So you're not taking up any extra room realistically. So a common question that I've had at work was, um, what time of day do we have the most sales? So they wanted to start running metrics to see in the online store what the peaks and valleys were during the day. If I didn't, if the system that we were using didn't track time, I could never give them those reports. I could tell them when it could happen. I could even sort the order the the records happened because I could sort by ID off the you know the for the synthetic key I could sort by ID up and down so at least I know what order they came in but if I didn't have the time I could never map when things happen so unless it's a piece of data that will never ever need a time again date of birth a uh, hiring date is a good one too termination date because realistically most companies don't get what minute the person was hired or what minute the person was fired. They just care when the day it happened. But, you know, even that, you should probably include the time so that you can make sure, you know, that for auditing purposes that they didn't terminate the person in the system before they were actually terminated kind of thing. Um, how big is the text? So are you going to need a VAR card? You're going to use a text field. And then the last line says, just say no to blobs. Blobs are a bad thing. 
blobs serve very few purposes. Um, so a lot of new database people will come in and they go, oh, this database supports blobs. Fantastic. I'm going to store my files in the database. What a stupid idea. Here's the problem. How big is a picture from your phone? On average. My phone, Galaxy 2, like 3.35 megabytes a picture. Doesn't sound very big. Three to five megabytes a picture. Now think back, you know, back in the day when I started working computers where a, a diskette held 1.4 megabytes, right? I'm a little old. Now, we are going to create a database that holds our pictures because we want to select star from pictures and we want to pull our pictures out of that. Cool. So every row is a single picture, four megabytes. We have a million pictures. I'm not even going to try to do the math. We're talking, you know, gigs, four gigs. Let's go with the, the table is now gigabytes. You need to do a backup. It's going to literally copy four gigabytes out of your database onto the disk. Database server shits the bed. Table gets corrupted. You're trying to repair the table. You're losing data. So a lot of people use blobs for storing data, like files in the database, just don't. What you do instead is use a varchar field and you store the path and the file name. You write the file somewhere on the disk. And then you just, whenever the application needs the file, it reads the path from the database, then reads the file from the disk. Two advantages to that approach. One. Your database stays small. What, maybe 50 bytes for the field name at most, 100 bytes, let's say, for the path and the file name. And then the files are on the disk. That means that they're getting picked up by the automated file system backup. So the backups for those are incremental, so that only back up what's new. Anything that hasn't changed doesn't get backed up, so your backups stay smaller too. Your database will be faster, there's less fat. So, of course, but people are going to say, well, there's still, they give us blob data types. Why do we have blob data types still? <clears throat> there's two purposes I found for blob data types. Type purpose one, you need to store text in a raw bare binary format. People are like, what do you mean by that? Okay, so I've got an, a translation application. I've got an application that lets me translate strings. So I've got the original string in one field, say it's in English. I want to translate it into. Chinese. The way MySQL is set up is you can't set the page, well, you actually can now, but put the code page per field. Means that for the translation, it would only allow me to do English or Chinese. You couldn't do, so you'd have a blob field so that you could actually put the translation in the field. It would not store the magic moon room, it would store the binary version of the moon room, the actual key character code for it. So that as you put in strings, it goes into the original native format that was given to the database. It's not being encoded by the database into something else. Um, that's one purpose for blobs. Uh, the other purpose for blobs is when you need to store binary data that's very, very small. Um, we have, um, like one of the things the company I work for does, we write printer, printer drivers. We actually write our own printer drivers for other people's printers. Can't sound stupid, right? You're going, oh, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you use the Canon printer driver? Because ours are better. It works with our software and they, you know, the rips are three times faster than Canon's. So we write our own printer drivers. Sometimes those printer drivers have escape characters in them. Or the escape base. You can't put that in a Varkar field. It'll throw up. So you store those in blobs. So it'll go, raw character goes in. It just so happens that this raw character is uh, the uh, ASCII code for escape because it's an escape code. It that's in a raw format for escape, which you know solves. That's pretty much why the only reason you use blobs. Yeah. Many languages. 
No, oh, and there's a few ways that's handled. Um, now, most interface elements, DAC, so those are going to go through standard translation files. So those are called uh, PO and POT files. Um, those are get, they're called get text. That's what it's literally called, get text files. So the application will substitute, will read the strings in memory and substitute the strings in memory for the UI. For things that are database based, um, often there'll be a translation table. So it'll have, okay, this is the record, this is the field, this is the value. And that field will either be, the table will be set up as uh, UTF-8 or UTF-16 as the character type. And UTF-8 and UTF-16 allows you to type pretty much anything into it, and it will retain it. Because if you have it, something as a Latin one or an ASCII table, then you use the standard ASCII characters, right? So, you know, like Alt-135 gives you a e accent accent grave, right? Uh, 132 will give you, actually, uh, 135 is a CCZ. Let's see with the little tail on it for people that speak French. Uh, yeah. Not really. Uh, you look at what's out there. You know, there's lots of sample de designs online. The Normally, when you're first starting out, you're not starting from scratch yourself. You're using somebody else's design first, and you learn through experience. There is no standard for anything. And uh, yeah, so that's what we do. And there's you do UTF-8, UTF-16. So you set up you set up the character, you set up the code page for the table properly, because uh, UTF-8, UTF-16 is only for edge cases. UTF-8 will handle pretty much every language on Earth. What it does, it'll store because, for example, Chinese is a really interesting one because they have four character, they have five character sets, as far as computers are concerned. There's uh, traditional and and modern, I think it's called the two different versions of Chinese for the traditional and simplified. Sorry, um, traditional and simplified. But the thing is, they got the native Chinese code pages, and then they've got the big eight code pages for both sets of those. So that means every character is duplicated twice in two sets of code pages. And then finally, they came up with something called UTF-8, International Text Format, 8-bit. I think that's what the 8 stands for. And it has codes for pretty much every language and every language in it. So you can store in Japanese, Chinese and Japanese in the same field, and it wouldn't care. It's the code page makes a difference, not the data type at that point. Okay, who spent more time on data types than I expected? That's good though. I don't, I'm not complaining. It's just good because people like questions. Um, okay, so we're almost done. Uh, synthetic versus natural keys. There, we're back to your synthetic keys. Um, so just quick refresh: composite key. It's a key made of two or more attributes. A natural key is a key formed from attributes that already exist in the real world. For example, social security numbers, SIN numbers, phone numbers, email addresses. Uh, a synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key, uh, it's a key that has no business meaning. It means it's catered on the fly. Uh, primary key, obviously we know what that is. And a foreign key, we also know what that is. Now, there are issues with natural keys. There's a lot of issues with natural keys. So natural keys have tend to have primary key size issues. Um, so surrogate keys don't have problems with index size because they're usually just a single column big int, and computers are really good at storing numbers. Um, like, I mean, you know, you can count to 32 on one hand, right? Most people don't know that. You can count 32 on one hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's only three fingers. This will bring us to 16. This will bring me up to 32. So with a single field, like literally one byte, you can store lots of numbers. With natural keys, the primary key is always going to be a set size. So if it's a synthetic, if it's a SIN number, it'll always be nine digits regardless. So it takes up a lot of room. Um, foreign key size, if the primary key is big, the foreign key is just going to be just as big. So that means you're doubling the size on everything. Uh, aesthetics. So 
some people like the look of natural keys because it's real data. It makes sense. I read that and I know what this is. But using synthetic keys, you tend to have uh, a lot less code than compound natural keys. Um, optionality and applicability. Surrogate keys have no problems with people not wanting to give their information. Um, let's just say you're going somewhere and you use a SIN number or an SSN number as your primary key. And the person says, no, I refuse to give you that piece of information. Well, you're now done doing business. On the other hand, if it's a synthetic key, you could add the person into the system. Without that, it's not going to care. It's not going to be offended. Um, so uniqueness. With synthetic keys, they're guaranteed to always be unique. With natural keys, there is risks for duplicate. I don't know if I told you guys the story about the duplicated uh, student number versus uh, the SID number versus passport number, or was that my other group? Must be the other group because I'm getting blank looks. So way back in the day when Algonquin first started, this was a prof that's been here forever that told me this story. Way back before the school had student numbers, it used to be you'd enroll here with your SID number. Your SID number was your student number. Man, the days when identity theft was not a big thing like it is now. So, which was cool. It worked like that for years. And suddenly they opened their doors to international students. The very first year, somebody applied and they gave their student visa number. They went to put in the student visa number. Student visa number was identical to somebody's SIN number in the system. They could not put that student in because they were using a natural key that was coming from two different places in the world that just so happened to overlap. So synthetic key wouldn't have cared. It would have given them a student number. It got patched, obviously, because um, now you all have student numbers. <laughs> but, you know, they, they had to do some emergency fixing. Um, privacy. Natural keys have privacy issues. Again. You have a database with people's SIN numbers or people's phone numbers. And that means that if you have a SIN number, can you imagine if the school still used your SIN number or whatever as your student ID? So you go up to the registrar's office, you go to the little wicket and you say, uh, I'd like to, you know, do something with my account. They go, can you have your SIN number? And you're literally standing there with people on each side and you rattle off your SIN number. That's a privacy issue in many, many levels. Um, so again, synthetic keys don't have a privacy issue because they don't have any real world meaning outside of the school. Does your student number have any meaning? No. After you get rid of the zero four, which is literally the institution number zero four, the rest of the numbers mean nothing. It's just literally, it's an auto increment field. Three people register back to back. They just go one, two, three with a zero four at the beginning. That's it. Um, accidental denormalization. Well, you can't denormalize synthetic keys. It's possible you'd end up, you could denormalize natural keys out of the way. Uh, cascading updates. Surrogate keys never change. So you don't have to worry about how to cascade them on an update. For example, let's just say you're using somebody's email address as your primary key. Stupid idea, but let's just go with it, right? Roll with me. So we have a record. Email address goes in as the primary key. Now we have five or six transactions. Of course, that email address gets carried into the child records. So this email address is in dozens of places. Person calls and says, yeah, um, my email address got compromised. I need to change my email address. Okay, no problem, sir. Of course, you go to change it in the parent record. It's going to say no because there's child records depending on that value. So you go, okay, no problem. I'm going to go change the child records. It's going to say no because there's no matching parent record. So how do you fix this? Is you literally take the parent record, copy it, replacing the primary key with the new value, update all the child records, change the primary key from one to the other, and then you delete the original parent record. It's terrible. And can anybody in here see that it's never going to go wrong ever? I see no problems with this. It'll never go wrong. Not in a million. It's always going to go wrong. Just assume it's going to go wrong. 
So it's terrible for cascading updates using natural keys. Uh, Varkar join speeds. Um, now, synthetic keys are usually numbers. That means they're fast. If you're trying to do joins with var cars, it has to compare every character. So let's say again, you're using the email address. So you got daniel.goudreau at somemail.com. It's got to compare the entire length of that string in the parent table and every child table during the join. And let's just say checking that length of string versus 55, 55, 55, 55, 56, 55 versus comparing it letter by letter, it's the speed is there. Um, disadvantage synthetic keys, there's always somebody who says there's disadvantages. Uh, getting the next value, uh, considering most su servers support auto increment of some sort, that's a moot point. MySQL has a modifier on, on ints called AI, auto increment, not auto artificial intelligence, auto increment. And you're allowed to have one of those per table. Every time you insert a row, it just grabs the next value. Done. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server does something similar. It's got something called identity. It'll just keep incrementing uh, automatically. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server's got a few different ones of that nature. Uh, Oracle and Postgres do the same thing. They have something called a sequence. And it sets the default to the next value of that sequence. It's kind of cool the way it does it. So a sequence, you can think of it as how many of you have had to go to um, somewhere where you have to take a number to wait your turn? Probably all of you, right? Pretty much at some point. You're going to the financial aid office. Grab your little paper. Number 96, currently serving 12. Oh, you're going to be there for a while, right? But you got your little number. But the fact that you've got 96 in your hand means that 96 is never going to come out of that roll again. It's never going to get reused. A sequence is the same thing. Every single time you ask it for a new value, it gives you the next value in the sequence and then increments to the next. So it's always ready to give you this as if it pulls out the next number every time. Uh, the cool part about with sequences is you can adjust them. So suddenly you say, oh, I need to skip like 10,000 numbers for whatever reason, because the business manager said, we don't like the fact that the invoices start at 100. We'd like it to make it look like we've had more business. So let's start at 10,000. So you can adjust the sequence to start at a higher number. MySQL, you can't do that. Well, you can. You insert a row in the table, and you you set it at ten thousand. No, not even that. It's MySQL is really dumb. What it does is it looks at the biggest value in the table. It gives you the next one, which is kind of special for performance when you think about it. Um, apparently, it's gotten really decent. It's cached, but it's got some problems. Um, the second one, the extra indexes, that's the only one when somebody will say, oh yeah, there's disadvantages of synthetic keys. It's honestly the only one that is valid. The only complaint that you'll have about it being invalid. I uh, mean, a complaint that is valid. So if you're using a natural key, a natural key as your primary key, it's going to be indexed, right? So that means if you're using an email address, primary key is indexed. Good, you have an index on your email address. If you're using a synthetic key, you are going to have an index for every all the alternate keys plus one for the primary key. So if you need to index the email address, you need to index um, a postal code and a phone number. Those are three indexes plus one for the synthetic key. Realistically, is it going to take up that much more room? No. Is it going to impact performance? No. It's just it's just one more index. Now back in the day when hard drives were measured in you know twenty megabytes, yeah that. That was really important. Like that little bit of space that it's was really important. I mean, at, right at my day job, our biggest database, last time I did a backup, it was 12 gigs. Uh, the backup was 12 gigabytes. Uh, it has upwards of 50 million rows of data in it in one table. There's like half a dozen tables of that size. So then they're really big tables, like just a lot of text in those tables, logs. So realistically, if your database is 16 gigs, who cares about using an extra 100, an extra two megabytes for those indexes? It's a valid complaint, but it's not valid, if you know what I mean. Okay, so this brings us to the end of today. Uh, so next week, I am going to double check what it is we're going to talk about real quick. 
Uh, just so you guys know what's coming. Uh, not this one. We're going to go here. 8250 lectures. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So next week I'm talking about indexes and views. Um, so your midterm, just so you know, is on the 21st. In this room, June 21st, in this room, at this time, I'll have the details specific next week. But just so you know, it's in this room this time. I say it now so that if you are a student that needs Cal accommodations, Center for Accessible Learning, you don't need to identify yourself to the group. But if you are a Cal student and you have an accommodation, you may want to reach out and book your time at the Cal Center so that you can get your accommodations properly. I don't think I actually have any accommodations for this group at all. I don't think I got a single letter of accommodation. I'm just throwing it out there in case you're still being processed. It's going to be on paper. Yes, sir. Everybody's favorite way to take tests. Scantron. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Scantron is multiple guess. Yes. So I'll have all the details next week because we have not been given permission to go back to electronic tests yet. None. I mean, how can I do a practical test on what I've been teaching? <laughs>